Hello everyone and welcome to EduCells Clinics where we discuss some key topics related to common medical and surgical practice. This is the second part of our video series on gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD and this part is going to focus on the medical therapy, the surgical therapy as well as the newer therapies. If you have not seen the first part, we covered the definitions as per the Montreal Consensus as well as the ACG Clinical Guideline of 2022, the Montreal Consensus of 2007. You can refer to these two articles to understand this disease perfectly. We have seen the clinical presentation in the natural history and we have seen the diagnostic algorithms. So now before going into management, understand that there are different types of GERD. One is symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux. That is the patient is at least one episode of GERD per month. Severe GERD is when the patient has three to four episodes of typical reflux syndrome per week. Atypical symptoms in GERD are basically chest pain, odinophagia or dysphagia. And we have already seen two important types of GERD on endoscopy that is non-erosive reflux disease that is when they do not have mucosal breaks and erosive reflux disease which is further divided by Los Angeles classification. So this base is important because different types will have different treatment which we will see in upcoming slides. Most important management part is medical management and in that most important part is lifestyle modification. Weight loss in overweight and obese patients. Avoid meals 2-3 to three hours before bedtime. Avoid tobacco. Avoid trigger foods which are basically tea, coffee, aerated beverages, chocolate, spicy and fried food. Everything that most of today's generation likes. Elevate the head on the, of the bed and sleeping on left side helps. Divide meals and avoid a large meals. Remember that in patients with GERD, this advice is the most important advice and you need to spend 5-10 minutes with the patient to explain all these points. Avoiding triggers, avoiding tobacco, avoiding aerotel beverages, large meals and weight loss. These are very important lifestyle modifications that work very effectively in treating these patients. Pharmacological therapy, we have already seen that an optimized trial of proton pump inhibitors is very important for healing and maintenance in erosive esophagitis. Medicine is to be given 30 to 60 minutes before a meal and not after meal. Remember that if the patient has symptom resolution, then try to discontinue PPI. Indefinite PPI therapy or anti-reflux surgery may be required in Los Angeles grade C or D. Baclofen or sucralfate are not routinely recommended in GERD except in pregnancy. Intermittent PPI therapy is okay for heartburn control in patients with non-erosive reflux disease. So this is the basic of PPI therapy as per the ACG Clinical Guidance 2022. Now, after you are treating your patients with PPI, the patients can have persistent symptoms at 8 to 12 weeks of double dose or BID PPI therapy. Remember that the treatment starts with OD PPI in esophageal type and BD in extraesophageal type. If the patient does not respond to OD, you can change the drug or increase the dose. If there are persistent symptoms after 8 or 12 weeks of double dose or BID PPI therapy, that is known as refractory GERD okay, or refractory reflux disease. The mechanisms can be persistent acid reflux or hypersensitivity to physiological acid reflux or presence of a misdiagnosis. Right, The patient can have achalasia, eosinophilic esophagitis, gastroparesis or heart disease but it is manifesting or misdiagnosed as GERD. Patient can also have functional disorders. So these are some of the mechanisms of refractory GERD. Now, when a patient has refractory GERD, the management depends on the algorithm that you used earlier. Okay, If you have treated your patient empirically with PPI without objective workup and the patient has had optimized PPI therapy, then you do an endoscopy. If endoscopy is normal, you do a reflux monitoring. 
and if reflux monitoring is also normal then there is no evidence of GERD and look for other causes if endoscopy is abnormal then you treat the cause that is identified and if the patient has erosive esophagitis or barrage more than 3 cm and still not responding or refractory, these are the patients who may be treated better by surgery or newer endoscopic therapies. Now, this is the second group where you have already done an endoscopy or pH monitoring and defined GERD. Then what you have to do is you have to check whether the patient had optimized proton pump inhibitor therapy. If it was optimized, then you have to again consider these patients for surgical or newer endoscopic therapies. The other option is to repeat an impedance pH monitoring and if it is abnormal, then consider surgical or endoscopic intervention or increase the dose of PPIs or change the PPI agent. However, if the pH monitoring is normal, then you can look at other causes of similar symptoms as well as functional causes. So diagnostic algorithm for refractory GERD, understand that you can do a diagnostic endoscopy with esophageal biopsies, esophageal pH monitoring, manometry to rule out esophageal motility disorders and impedance pH monitoring in patients with established GERD which is now refractory. So these are the four different tests that you can use in patients with refractory GERD. Remember the definition is 8 to 12 weeks of optimized PPI therapy of double dose or BID dosing. Okay. Can we use long-term PPI? The answer is yes, but try to discontinue or continue it at the lowest dose once the symptoms have improved. Common side effects include headache, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and flatulence. There is no significant increase in the risk of pneumonia, stomach cancer, osteoporosis, CKD, vitamin mineral deficiencies, heart attack, strokes, or dementia in patients with long-term PPI. However, there is an increased risk of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that should be remembered. Right? So, these are the issues with long-term PPI use. Now, going to surgical and endoscopic therapy, the most important indication is failed medical therapy. That is unsatisfactory symptom relief or not tolerating PPI due to severe side effects. So, failed medical therapy is the most common indication for surgical or endoscopic therapy. Other common indication is severe GERD or complicated GERD. Complicated GERD is in natural history a GERD with stricter or Barrett's esophagus. Extraesophageal or atypical symptoms are often refractory to PPI therapy. In these patients may need surgery. If patients not willing for long-standing PPI, then patient preference you may have to do surgical or endoscopic therapy. Right? Very important to remember that preoperatively you have to do a manometry with or without provocative swallows to rule out achalasia as well as absent esophageal contractility. If you forget this, the surgery may fail, okay? Because if the achalasia is present or there is absent esophageal contractility, the surgery is not going to benefit. Instead, it's going to harm your patient. So, don't forget the manometry before surgery. So options for surgical and endoscopic therapy, this is itself is a big topic, but as per the guidelines, what to select, you can select an anti-reflux surgery. Now, all these names are asked as multiple choice questions. Remember that laparoscopic Nissen is a gold standard for GERD. and why gastric bypass is preferred for obese patients with BMI greater than 35 with GERD. This is because these patients have higher complication rate with fundoplication disruption or fundoplication herniation through the hiatus and therefore they have poor outcomes with fundoplication. So for patients with BMI greater than 35, a rua by gastric bypass is a better option. Newer therapies, magnetic sphincter augmentation known as LINX. It is an alternative to laparoscopic fundoplication but the comparative data is yet not out. Endoscopic anti-reflux therapy, there is something known as transoral incisionless fundoplication. 
This is to be used as of now in patients who are unwilling for anti-reflux surgery, do not have severe esophagitis or hiatal hernia more than 2 cm. The setup procedure as per this guideline is not recommended, right? So you have these options in managing the patients who are not responding to medical therapy. So to summarize the entire topic now, we saw definitions, clinical presentation and diagnosis in the first part and we saw the medical management, role of surgery, the indication, the importance of preoperative manometry, options of surgery and we saw the newer therapies. If you want to review the first part, you can go to our website www.learnwithadducer.in where you will have a lot of video content as well as recommended books and upcoming blog series. So you can visit our website and have a look at all this content that may help you in your practice as well as exams. Thank you.